D.E. Vicorda Galaire, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. In a few months' time, Ireland will celebrate a number of important anniversaries. The general election victory of Sinn Féin will be followed by the opening of Dáil Éireann and the Solo Head Beg ambush, both on the 21st of January. Solo Head Beg is considered to be the start of the War of Independence, but it is far from the first attack during this time period. I've mentioned already how the period before the general election is often brushed over rather quickly, and the attack on Gertha Clay RIC barracks near Tralee in April of 1918 is one event that falls victim to this. Two Irish volunteers were killed in this attack, and on this day 100 years ago, the 18th of June 1918, their comrades set out to take revenge. Thomas McKellistrom had been elected captain of the Ballymckelligat Company of the Irish Volunteers after his release from Frangach in August of 1916. On the 10th of April 1918, he assembled six members of the company to plan an attack on the Gartha Clay RIC barracks with the aim of securing weapons. As with many of these early operations, this did not have the approval of the volunteer executive and did not come from them as an order. This was being carried out purely on the initiative of the men involved. It was known that there were four officers in the barracks, and the aim was to get inside after two of them had left on their nightly patrol. On the night of the 13th of April, McKellistrom and five of his men hid by a railway line close to the barracks, while the other member of the group, Jack Flynn, waited at the train station for the patrol to leave. His job was to alert McKellistrom when they left, and then follow them so that he could report back when they were returning. McKellistrom was armed with a revolver, three men were armed with shotguns, and two more had only batons, showing up the desperate need rural units had for proper weapons. At half nine, Flynn reported that Sergeant Boyle and Constable Fallon had left the barracks, and he was ordered to follow them. McKellistrom led the men to the barracks but found the door to be locked, which he hadn't expected. The men were wearing masks, as they would have been well known to the officers inside, and what follows taken from McKellistrom's statement to the Bureau of Military History, shows the lack of suspicion that existed at the time between the RIC and the people. The door was locked and I had to knock. An RIC man, Constable Considine, came to the door and asked, Who is there? I said, It is me. He then asked, Who are you? I said in a friendly tone, It is me, come on and open. He did open, and as he did so, I dashed past him. As part of the plan, McKellistrom rushed past Considine to hold up the other RIC constable there, a constable Denning, while the men following him held up Considine. The two RIC men were brought to the front room and watched over by John Brown, who was armed with a shotgun, while McKellistrom went to the barrack room and began taking rifles off the rack. While doing so, he heard a shot ring out and turned around in time to see Brown fall over. He had been shot through the head from outside the building, and as Richard Laid was turning to warn his comrades, he was wounded in the stomach by another volley of fire. McKellistrom thought that the building might be surrounded and that they would have to fight their way out. They picked up Brown's body and left through the front door, firing two shots. There was silence until they tried to lift his body over a railing that surrounded the barracks, at which stage another round of fire was directed at them. They left Brown and made their escape. They possibly didn't know how badly injured Laid was. He tried to follow after them, but made it only as far as his downed comrade. It is an hour later before the RIC men leave the barracks and hear Laid's moans. They took himself and Brown into the building, where Brown died shortly afterwards. Though McKellistrom says he died within five minutes of being shot, the bullet had hit him in the temple and exited through the back of his head. It's alleged that when his body was being taken away, Constable Fallon said derisively, You can wrap the green flag around him. Laid was taken to Tralee Hospital, where he died the following morning, the 14th of April. What had happened was that after Jack Flynn had informed McKellistrom that the patrol had left the barracks, he returned to the train station, where he met a friend of his. He felt compelled to walk his friend part of the way home to allay suspicion. Maybe he was wondering what Flynn was doing there at that time of night. Flynn walked with him for some 300 yards and then lost sight of Fallon and Boyle. It appears they had turned back shortly after leaving the barracks, and McKellistrom thinks that when he knocked on the door and rushed in, they were within just 10 yards of him. A yard is a common unit of measurement at the time, which Google tells me is about 91 centimetres. It's unclear if the door was left open or if they manoeuvred to a front window, but they were able to get a clear line of sight on Brown, drew their pistols and fired. 
While it's clear that McAllistrum has a solid military mind, and this will be proven going forward, and that he has put a lot of thought into this plan, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. The men are heavily drilled in marching and presenting arms, but not so on rushing barracks or improvisation in the heat of battle. A lot of mistakes were made, and the company has paid dearly, but we're going to see this repeated going forward with many of the early attacks carried out by the volunteers as they seek out weapons. Brown and Laid were buried in Ra Cemetery in Tralee, and the funeral attracted 6,000 mourners. Jack Flynn, whose friend distracted him from the job at hand, was killed during the IRA attack on Castle Island on the 10th of July 1921, the last attack before the truce came into effect at midnight, and is buried in the same grave as his comrades, who fell in what is arguably the first action of the War of Independence. Fallon and Boyle were awarded for their bravery, but also moved out of the county. In June, though, McEllistrom got word that an inquest would be held into Brown and Laid's deaths at Tralee Courthouse, and that Fallon and Boyle would be called upon to give evidence. On the night beforehand, the 17th of June, McEllistrom held a meeting with a number of volunteers and proposed that they kill the two men as they came off the morning train from Cork. Dan Stack was organised to drive a donkey and cart to the train station with a large sack concealing two shotguns for carrying out the job. The following morning, McEllistrom cycled to the racecourse where he would meet John Cronin, the other gunman, and travel to the train station together, but while there, he was met by a different volunteer who told him that Fallon and Boyle had arrived the evening beforehand. On the spot, McEllistrom decided that they would instead shoot the two men as they left the courthouse during lunch. He met with Stack at the train station and told him to bring the donkey and cart down towards the courthouse, and they took the sack containing the weapons into Harty's bar. For anyone who knows Tralee today, Harty's Bar is now Bailey's Corner, which is no longer located at Bailey's Corner and is no longer a corner. Bailey's Corner is now a cafe, it's wild, but you can go through Harty's Bar from Castle Street and the back exit was, and still is, facing the side of the courthouse. Here McEllistrom, and when he arrived Cronin, took up a position in a snug while Stack was sent to watch for Fallon and Boyle. At five minutes past one, there was a tap on the door of their snug. Coming down the other side of the street, Boyle and Fallon, Stack told them. McEllistrom and Cronin took out their loaded shotguns and exited Harty's bar onto Castle Street. Court day a hundred years ago was a big occasion and the town was thronged with people. They spotted their targets on the other side of the road and as they dashed towards them, McEllistrom describes what happened next. Boyle and Fallon turned in our direction and saw us facing them with two shotguns. They first attempted to draw their guns. We lifted ours to fire. We were now only 10 yards from them. As we did, they flung themselves backwards in a somewhat sitting position on the flags. We took aim and fired. They were both wounded. Cronin and I dropped our shotguns in the middle of the street, dashed again for Harty's front entrance, out through the shop to the back, where we jumped on our bicycles and got clear away. Fallon was taken to hospital where he was treated for wounds to his upper back and made a full recovery. Boyle, on the other hand, had escaped all injury and had not even been hit. In the aftermath of the shooting, martial law was declared in the town, which may have lasted for up to six months, and all roads leading into Tralee were barricaded for up to three weeks. Permits were required to enter the special military area, and a curfew was imposed, making it one of the first areas in the country to see martial law since the 1916 Rising. Imposing martial law on a town or a city is very different to imposing it on a whole county. Towns can be barricaded and curfews more easily enforced. The people of Tralee don't seem to have been too put out, and there aren't any reports on what life was like under martial law at the time. But when the city of Limerick is cut off in April of 1919, things will be very different. Looking back on them now, we can see a number of failings in these early missions. Most notable is the use of shotguns. Large and clumsy to carry, they do little damage and have to be abandoned on the spot. In December, in the village of Onnescall, which is between Tralee and Dingle, a feud between two families escalates when the head of one of them gets notions after becoming a justice of the peace and involves the RIC in the feud. Ty Kennedy, a native of the village, has just gotten off at the train station when a young boy tells him that an RIC man is about to be shot. Looking to stop this, Kennedy rushes to the barracks where he sees a man take a knee, bring a shotgun to his shoulder and fire at an RIC constable who has just exited the barrack door. 
In the confusion, the man escapes, and the constable is taken to Dingle Hospital, where he is found to be uninjured and just suffering from shock. His RIC regulation greatcoat, which he would have put on due to the cold weather, had stopped all of the shot. Some 40 years before the invention of Kevlar, all you needed was a good strong coat to resist the IRA. Now this shows up why McKellistrom needed to raid for weapons in the first place, but it also shows maybe a lack of understanding around the weapons that they are using, and reminds me of Joe Good's worry about the underpowered pistols that they have been issued with for their mission to London. The operation shows brilliant planning and initiative, but not the best execution. At 10 yards, they were too far away to kill their targets, and they have no way to follow up should they have missed with their first rounds. But these are staggering blows to the established order all the same. The authority and respect that the RIC commanded is beginning to fade, as they are associated with a regime that looks more alien and hostile on a daily basis, especially as the RIC would have been used in imposing conscription. Once a position in the RIC was seen as the height of respectability, now its officers are being stalked by gunmen in the streets of Tralee. The heavy-handed response that follows can't have won any support for the authorities either. McKellistrom says that raids for him and Cronin are continuous at Ballymichelligat and that up to 30 houses a night are often hit up, which would have done further damage to the reputation of the RIC. So why aren't these actions in Kerry considered to be the start of the War of Independence? I'm going to deal with this mostly on the episode around Solo Head Beg in January, but unlike the men who took part in that attack, McKellistrom wasn't looking to start a war. In relation to Solo Head Beg, where two RIC men were killed, Dan Breen said, The only regret that we had following the ambush was that there were only two policemen in it, instead of the six we had anticipated. Six would have made a bigger impression than a mere two. Contrast that with McKellistrom's statement on the Gertha Clay attack. The attack was for the purpose of getting arms, and we wished to avoid shooting if possible. Due to the conscription crisis then beginning, the attack on the barracks, which wasn't exactly a success, went totally unreported in the national papers, whereas Solo Head Beg happened on the same day as the opening of Dal Aaron. The court day attack on the 18th of June suffered the same fate, as it was just two days out from the East Cavan by-election, which was dominating news headlines, and the British would also have imposed restrictions on publicising the attack. There are still weapons raids throughout mid and late 1918, but most of the attention focuses on the conscription crisis, the German plot arrests, and the general election. Even after Solo Head Beg, violence is sporadic and isolated to only a few pockets of the country, and it takes a while to manifest into a war. Whatever failings these attacks had, and they will be replicated in early attacks around the country in the year ahead, McKellistrom and his men have shown tremendous initiative in acting without direct orders from general headquarters. GHQ will effectively abandon large sections of the country to their own devices, failing to arm or support them, an initiative like this will be needed to keep up pressure on the British forces. McKellistrom and his men have struck an early blow in the upcoming war, and will take a leading role in the War of Independence in Kerry in the years ahead. I was only reminded of this incident recently while I was working on an episode for the East Cavan by-election, which will be out on the 20th. As a native, I have a better knowledge of the War of Independence in Kerry than I would on other parts of the country. Going forward, I'm going to be working off a few chronologies of the Irish Revolution, particularly the one at the start of Morris Walsh's Bitter Freedom. But even in that, the events of today's episode were overlooked. These books tend to cover the big ambushes and attacks, the headline stories, and events like the one covered today can be missed out on. So, unless you want a podcast series dedicated totally to the events of Kerry in the War of Independence, if you think there are events coming up I might miss out on, do warn me on the Irish Nation Lives Twitter account, which is linked in the description. What I will do shortly is create a calendar which I can share and I will put up the events that I know of that are coming up so you can contact me and tell me of any that I've missed out on. I won't be able to do an episode on every single event that occurs, but I can put up articles about them on the Twitter account. Accordia, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of old.